Welcome to our Advanced Commercial Real Estate Training Series. I'm your host, Lauren Keim, and I'm excited to spend the next 90 minutes helping you to get your career to the next level. I'm hoping you've taken the time to watch and learn from our Fundamentals of Commercial Real Estate Program and our Practice of Commercial Real Estate Program. Those parts of this training series will help prepare you for your career in commercial real estate. Now, I've just completed a study of why some of you are full-time commercial agents or brokers. Through my exhaustive research, I've concluded that you didn't become full-time commercial agents because you want to work during normal business hours, or because you like bigger commission checks, or because you enjoy hobnobbing with professional business people. No, you became full-time commercial realtors and brokers because you like using terms like discounted cash flow analysis and internal rate of return, because it makes you look smart. And so I'm going to open today with a critical study that we've just completed, just finished it. Yes, the top five reasons that residential realtors do not sell commercial real estate. Number five, residential realtors really enjoy working every other night and every single weekend with home buyers who probably aren't serious about buying a home. The number four reason that residential realtors do not sell commercial real estate, they love doing open houses on Sundays. Number three, they would much rather sell that condo down the street for $37,500 than the office building across town for $800,000. It makes them feel more complete inside. The number two reason, they believe that the math of commercial real estate is more complicated than calculating their 70% commission split with a 6% franchise fee and a 20% referral fee on that condo down the street for $37,500. And the number one reason that residential realtors do not sell commercial real estate is they are intimidated because the commercial brokers keep using terms like discounted cash flow analysis and the internal rate of return. Seriously though, one of the largest groups we train are what we call resi-mercial agents who sell both commercial investment real estate and residential real estate. And I truly applaud all of you who are looking to grow and expand your careers, expand your horizons and build a solid commercial investment clientele, as long as you can truly service that clientele. Which is why today we're going to talk about exceptional or legendary quality service, the lifetime value of a customer, moments of truth in your business, and some systems of developing more customers. But before you click the remote and turn off this program, because of course, you've all heard all of this before, I want to stress that we're going to take your companies beyond the usual. We're going to lay out a specific divine program for growth. See, my background is engineering, and I bring that to everything I do. I need specific action steps and systems that make anything go. Have you read The E-Myth by Michael Gerber? It's one of the best-selling business books of all time. And if you haven't read it, go to Amazon and get a copy or Barnes & Noble. Gerber explains that 80% of businesses fail in the first four years. 80% of the remaining businesses fail before the fifth year. And if you're lucky enough to make it past those first five years, well, unfortunately, 80% of the surviving businesses fail in the next five years after that. Part of the why small businesses fail is that the owner is the business. Going out and finding the business, creating all the revenue, but also taking out the trash, putting out fires and handling each and every problem and issue that arises. And eventually, even if we're doing well as small business owners, we simply burn out. I've mentored under two great trainers over the years. The first was Joe Stumpf, the creator of the main event program. And the second was Ralph Williams, who co-created the Orbit training program. Ralph used to tell us that we need to create real estate companies that have value, companies that we can sell later. And you can't sell a business if that business is you. You have to put systems in place that will create success long after you're lying on a beach in the Bahamas. Lauren, you might say, we don't need to know all this touchy-feely stuff. We need to know how to effectively compete against CBRE or Cushman and Wakefield or Jones Lang LaSalle or Cobble Banker Commercial or whoever your local competitor might be. But let me explain why these systems are so critical. See, I'm on the faculty at Lehigh University's Goodman Center for Real Estate Studies. Our students spend a lot of money to get a business degree and a lot more to finish their MBA. But if you want to work as a commercial real estate professional with one of the teams that's currently selling skyscrapers in New York City or Boston or maybe even Washington, D.C., it really helps to have a degree from Harvard or NYU or Lehigh University. Our students are the who's who of commercial real estate. Of course, outside Lehigh, I'm also the host of this program, 
and other commercial real estate training with Real Estate's Next Level Education. We have had graduates of Lehigh that have sold billions of dollars in real estate. Billions with a B. In some companies, the broker will do backflips if any agent sells 20 or 30 or 40 million dollars, right? Our university has graduates who have managed and leased some of the premier properties in the world, including the New World Trade Center. And guess what? They're realtors just like you. And by the way, they don't sell billions of dollars because of the firm they may be affiliated with. They don't sell that much because uh, of some super secret marketing system known only to a select few. They sell that much real estate because they're able to build relationships with clients that lead to bigger and bigger clients. See, this is a relationship business. The only difference is scale. Certainly, commercial superstars are consistent in everything they do. They have systems in place to manage their business. But ultimately, their business is based on the connections they make and the relationships they build. I've had the opportunity in the past few years to meet three different billionaires. All of them made their money in real estate. Two of them made it in property flipping. No, I'm not talking about buying a two unit in San Francisco, painting it white, putting in new carpeting and flipping it on HGTV. I'm talking about getting pension funds and institutional investors to put up the money to buy a very big class B building in a major metropolitan area for let's say $350 million. Then putting $120 million or $150 million into bringing it back up to Class A level, removing interior columns, creating a new facade, a new lobby, high-speed elevators, and so on. Then leasing that property to creditworthy tenants at higher rates and flipping the building for $800 or $850 million or maybe a billion. It's still property flipping, but the difference between flipping a skyscraper and flipping that two unit out in San Francisco is scale. The transaction is effectively the same. And again, some graduates are leasing some of the most well-known buildings in the world and signing some of the biggest commercial leases in history. And they are able to accomplish this partly because of their technical and product knowledge and their experience. But there are lots of great realtors in big cities with product knowledge and experience and great teams. The key is to understand how to build relationships with your customers. And sometimes that means building ties with the decision makers in pension funds or investment pools or with the architects who design projects. But ultimately, it's about building relationships. And if that works for billion dollar clients, won't it also work for the owner of the Okinawa restaurant or the strip mall the restaurant's in? Or the small hotel and restaurant down the street or the owner of a medical office building in your marketplace? We all know that we don't become successful just because we work hard, do we? Let's start by understanding the service mindset and building the experience. Let's go back to service for a minute. Back in the 1990s, I used to do a workshop called Legendary Service. And I used examples from all sorts of businesses on how they set themselves apart from their competition. And every time I'd walk on stage, someone would say, we already have great service. Well, let's be perfectly honest. We all have posters on the wall proclaiming our great service, right? We have mission statements putting our customers first. But do we really deliver not just what the customer expects, but beyond the customer's expectations? Quality is how well our service meets our customer's expectations and needs. But do we go beyond those expectations? After all, being over-promised and under-delivered is a way of life in the real estate industry, isn't it? And I realize part of what you consider to be good service depends on where you're located. Now, we've trained brokers and agents all over the globe. For example, you can always tell the Midwestern brokers from the Northeastern broker. Midwestern brokers are polite and they open doors for people. On the other side, I'm from the New York and Philly metro areas. Our area tends to be a bit more, shall we say, aggressive. You can see the difference between regions when you're at the elevator bank at any uh, conference or convention. The Northeastern brokers are the ones knocking people out of the way to get to the elevator. In the Midwest, people are really polite. So do you really know when people are dissatisfied with your business? Do they tell you or do they just shrug it off and never come back? See, in New York or Philadelphia, if people are dissatisfied, oh, they let you know. Again, being overpromised and underdelivered is a way of life in the real estate industry, isn't it? With a decent real estate company, our clients might get what they expect. We might meet their expectations. Are we going to create raving fans of our business just by meeting the customer's needs and expectations? 
Are they going to excitedly refer us so much business that we never, ever, ever have to prospect again? See, everything we do, we have to consider from the customer's point of view. What do you do that uniquely differentiates yourself from your competitors? It's not your marketing. You've got big, beautiful commercial signs, right? Yeah, your competitors have big signs too. And you're on the internet. Well, so are your competitors. Well, you use LoopNet and CoStar. Well, so do your competitors. You make some really nice brochures on high quality paper, don't you? So does your competition. If you've been to one of my workshops in the past, you may have seen me talk about differentiating yourself by using USP. We call that a unique selling proposition. So hey, now you're a retail specialist or an office specialist or a land development specialist. USPs really are great, but guess what? Your competitors got one too. Many large commercial firms preach about their databases, how they have their fingertips on lists of possible investors to buy any property. And they do. But can't you get those lists also? In the old days, the big firms were the keepers of information, but today, you can pick up the information on Prospect Now or even CoStar, and you can send out the same mailings, same emails, and call the same people with the tools that are available today. So again, if everyone is effectively the same, what uniquely differentiates you from your competitors? Well, the only thing left is the intangible, right? Here's something you probably don't want to hear. Customers do not make their decisions logically. They make their decisions from their heart or their gut. If you don't believe that, check out the stock market. Look at all the smart, well-educated, MBA-toting wealthy investors who fall victim to irrational exuberance. Think about how we vote for presidents or senators or congresspeople in this country. Do you really think it's logical? If you haven't seen the clip on YouTube of the Atlanta congressman who was concerned that if we put military personnel on the huge island of Guam, the island might tip over and capsize into the ocean. Seriously, he was reelected. We don't make decisions logically. We have to find a way to differentiate ourselves so much that our clients tell their friends, their relatives, their coworkers, and everybody else that they cannot use our competition. Don't call Doggy Breath Realty. Everyone needs to call Lauren Keim. Why? If we could turn 30 or 40 or 50% of our past clients, and by the way, a side note, I don't like the word past client. It means we've ended our relationship with them. Even when we complete a transaction, we call it a closing. We need to alter our language. They're not past clients and this is not a closing. It's a settlement or a celebration or a transaction or whatever. And these are our clients, our customers, our friends. So if we could turn 30 or 40 or 50 percent of those clients who've had recent transactions with us into raving fans, into advocates of our business, instead of simply satisfied customers, and each of those 50 percent referred us, well, one piece of business year after year. What would that do to our businesses? It's not just possible. It's been done in real estate firms and teams over and over across the country. It's been done with top teams around the world. It comes as a result of altering our customers' perception of us versus our competitors. We can create predictable, quantifiable results in our business by directing referrals with the systems that we put into place. If you've been in real estate for more than 20 years, do you recognize this line? Go to the office three days a week and sit down and make cold calls until you get an appointment. Go on three appointments a week and you will earn an above average income even if we parachute you anywhere in the country. You're familiar with that line? It's the mantra of many real estate trainers and some of them are very good. Is that true by the way? Can you make a lot of money calling strangers every single day of your life? Of course it is. But how does it make you feel? And do you really want to be doing that when you're say 60 or 70 or 80 years old? Or would you rather be sitting on a beach drinking an exotic tropical drink with a name that you can't pronounce? We can be the traditional salesperson. Look for the next deal, the next deal, the next deal. Customers are like buses after all. They come regularly and they come often, right? If we don't do well with this client, how oh well we'll do a great job with the next one. Next! I'm sorry, is that too harsh or is that indicative of our industry? And by the way, what really matters is not what we do but how the customer views what we do what the customer's perception is of what we do. The Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, knowing others is wisdom, knowing yourself is enlightenment. The most difficult concept for many of us to grasp is the concept that how we see ourselves is not how others see us. So we have to align our vision, what we want to be, with our product and the experience that we deliver to the customer. 
You see, we all want raving fans. We all want advocates of our business that will sell us to everyone else. How do we accomplish that? We have to both create a culture in our organizations to foster it, and we need to build systems so the process is not dependent on you or your current assistant or your current receptionist or your current team members. Have you ever heard a trainer or a speaker talk about the product and the experience? What you're seeing on the screen is called a business scorecard. I have several variations of this that I use with companies that we mentor, and some are more complex. But the basic idea is that a customer can be satisfied, dissatisfied, or wowed with the product or service that they purchase from any business. The experience they receive during the transaction can meet their expectations, be below their expectations, or exceed their expectations. We want, no, we need our clients to fall into the top box to become our advocates. Every business is a product or service that they sell. You might sell ice cream at an ice cream store or vacuum cleaners at a vacuum cleaner store. You might practice law or you might do income taxes or sell insurance or you might sell real estate. That's the product you're providing. The experience is how the customer feels about how they were treated during the transaction. So let's use a restaurant as an example. I love steaks, that's pretty obvious, right? If I go to a steakhouse, there are two components to my purchase. The first is the food, and the second is how I'm treated before, during, and after the meal. Have you ever gone to a restaurant, you've been seated, uh, and you have to wait and wait and wait and wait for a server to show up and get a drink order, much less bring drinks, and God forbid, if I try and get a refill, the server's missing an action. Even if the steak is fantastic, will I go back? Well, I might if I really like the steak, but I'm certainly not going to refer it to anyone else. I'm not going to call my friends, I'm not going to post it on Facebook, hey, you've got to try this place. The product in a restaurant transaction is the food, and the experience is the service that they deliver. If you eat a great meal with an exceptional service at a restaurant, you can't wait to tell everybody. You want to post it on your Facebook page, you want to tweet it, you want to pin a photo of the place on Pinterest, right? Well, young people do. I want that kind of response for my real estate business, don't you? I did a workshop in St. Louis and I arrived at a very expensive hotel. I was tired because I had driven in from Chicago and I needed to get to a meeting, but I really needed a shower and to change. In the room there were no towels, none, zero, zip, nada. I called down to the front desk and they apologized and said they'd send some right up, but it took them nearly an hour to get the towels to me. From the hotel's perspective, did they meet my expectations? Sure, they brought me towels. From my perspective, did they meet my expectations? Absolutely not. And worse, did they exceed my expectations so I become a raving fan of that very expensive hotel? This is what we call a moment of truth or an impact moment or a strategic moment. A customer, in this case me, can get what they expect or they can be disappointed or they can be impressed. The way to impress the client is to react outrageously. I am so sorry, Mr. Kime will have towels there in five minutes, and then have the towels there in four, and send along a gift certificate for a free $5 appetizer at the restaurant or something, and have the management call after the towels are delivered to make sure everything's okay. That's how to do it. Has anybody stayed at a Ritz-Carlton? You can check your bags at the curb, and they radio ahead to tell the front desk that Lauren Kime is coming. He's wearing a really ugly Hawaiian shirt. What the heck was he thinking? As I approach the desk, the receptionist looks up, she maintains positive eye contact and says, Mr. Kime, welcome to the Ritz-Carlton. When I get to my room, they call. Mr. Kime, this is Mabel Finkelbaum at the front desk. Is everything okay in your room or is there anything we can get for you? That's service that we repeat to everyone we know. In the book, How to Win Customers and Keep Them for Life by Michael Lebeau, he came up with the following study. A typical business hears from only 4% of its dissatisfied customers. The other 96% just quietly go away and 91% will never come back. Of those customers who are dissatisfied, 14% are dissatisfied with the product or the service, like the price they received on their property. But 68% were unhappy because of an attitude of indifference toward the customer by the owner, manager, or some employee. 68%. A typical dissatisfied customer will tell 8 to 10 people about his problem. One in five will tell 20. It takes 12 positive service incidents to make up for one negative incident. However, Lebeau found that 7 out of 10 complaining customers will do business with you again if you resolve the complaint in their favor. 
And if you resolve it on the spot, 95%, that's 19 out of 20, will do business with you again. And of those people that complain that you resolved immediately, about 20% of them will actually become a fan of your business and tell people the story of how you solve their complaint. That's one in five. In the real estate field, our product is the sale or purchase. The experience is how they feel they were treated during the transaction. Going back to the chart on the screen, on the product side, if we sell the property quickly for a fair price, we'll be in that top band. The same is true if we're working for a buyer or a lease and we find them the perfect property. The product is up here. They, we exceed their expectations because everyone expects to be somewhat disappointed, don't they? If we overprice the property because we want them to like us and it takes us forever to sell or lease the property, we may be in this lower quadrant. On the experience side of the chart, if we list the property and we abandon the seller until we have an offer, they're dissatisfied, right? If we contact them once in a while, they're getting what they expect. If on the other hand, we're accessible to them, and by being accessible, I don't mean only you. That accessibility might mean your team or your assistant being accessible. If we can program them to realize they don't need to talk just to you. We provide everything they want and we use a few tools and techniques to positively surprise them with our service. We will exceed their expectations and they will tell their family, their friends, and everybody they know, every business associate out there, to call us. But we need to be honest with our customers so the property moves in a timely manner and so we don't overinflate their expectations in order to get into this top band. And then we have to have a system in place to exceed their expectations of service in order to create a raving fan of our real estate practices. The system I'm going to run through for our program today targets two primary audiences our current customers, and our recent transactions. First, where are we most likely to get customers from today? Actually, from our current customers that we're working with right now. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. Second, and alternately, where has most of our business come from over the past year, the past five years, the past decade? From our past clients. Now, let me start with current clients. Why are current clients the most likely place to get business from right now today? Let me pause so you can consider an answer to that. Are you familiar with the term the reticular activator? And I'm sorry if you've heard it before. It's a term that's been overused and abused by trainers around the country. But it's critical to understand something about the way business flows. The reticular activator is your extrathalmic control modulatory system. It controls your breathing when you sleep. It helps change your body processes to wake up when it's time to wake up, even if your alarm doesn't go off. And have you ever had your hair stand up on the back of your neck you feel a little twinge because you know something around you just isn't right, but you don't know what that is? That's your reticular activator that's generating that fight or flight sensation. It also has an interesting function that filters information you take in and brings important information to your attention. For example, if you're walking through a crowded Las Vegas casino with dozens or hundreds of people talking and bells going off and lights flashing and somebody says your name across the room, you hear it, don't you? How does that filter through? That's your reticular activator filtering the noise, the other messages or stimuli, and bringing to you what's important to you. And by the way, you are important to you. It also finds commonalities if they're important to you. The classic example is if you just went out and purchased a new car. You drive it off the lot and suddenly you notice that everybody must have gone out and bought the same car this week. It's because your reticular activator is helping you to focus on something new that's important to you you see the same car that you're driving. Pregnant women see other pregnant women because of their focus on that and so on. You may have read Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. It's one of the best-selling books of all time. The basis is that the reticular activator is so powerful that if you set goals, say affirmations, and visualize your goals as if they're complete, your brain is going to find a way to achieve them. So what does it have to do with your clients? When are our clients most receptive to other people having a real estate transaction? When they themselves are working on a real estate transaction. When a young couple decides to buy a house, it seems like all their friends are buying as well. When someone's selling a house, they commiserate with everyone else at work who's also selling. If you're part of a chamber of commerce, it seems like every retail business who's moving to bigger space knows every other retail business that's moving to bigger space. And when an investor is trying to lease or sell their commercial space, 
They notice everyone else they're connected with trying to buy, sell, or lease space. We want to use our client's laser-like focus, created by the reticular activator, to bring us more clients. Our current clients will become our very best source of leads if they're programmed to help us find warm leads. Now I'm going to go through a number of systems for current clients in a minute, but let's backtrack for a minute to where our current business has been coming from and see if maybe we can enhance that business. Have you ever tracked the percentage of your closed real estate business that comes from repeat customers, your sphere of influence, or now it's called your social network, and referrals from your repeat customers and your social network or sphere of influence? There are lots of great resources for this, but our numbers show that 64% of a typical real estate company's business comes from repeat customers, their sphere of influence, and referrals from those two groups. Those are the people who like and trust us, and sadly, the ones we are least likely to maintain contact with. Only 15% of our business comes from cold calling, mailing to strangers, calling expired listings or for sell by owners. Just 15% comes from proactive prospecting. So why do we spend so much of our time, effort, and money attacking that segment of the market? See, if we don't have any past clients, then we must prospect continually to start filling our pipeline, filling our database with potential customers. We subscribe to Prospect Now or to CoStar and we start hammering the phones. But once we've been doing this a while, we need to shift our focus to what we have versus what we don't have. We have to maintain the relationships that we build because those relationships can help us to take our business to the next level. So we're going to come back to our current customer systems in a minute, but looking at these past relationships, if we've abandoned some of our past clients, how do we reconnect? Sure, you can pick up the phone and call everyone and hope they'll send us more referrals, right? But I'm an engineer, so I like to put everything into a system, a process, and build something that becomes part of our business. I call it the apology process, reconnecting with those that you have abandoned. Do you stay in contact regularly with all of your past clients in your sphere of influence, your social network, to remind them that you need their help in growing your business? And by the way, this is not a lightning bolt idea, is it? Do you use a CRM, a contact relationship management system, to help you to maintain contact? And by the way, sending them a monthly newsletter or a recipe card is not enough. It's a start, but it's not enough. First, you have to, have to, have to, have to have a database. You have to have a system to continually communicate with your friends, your past clients, your sphere of influence, your former coworkers, and remind them what you do. We set up a contact relationship management system for real estate office a few years ago. All the agents had to do was plug in the names, addresses, phone numbers, and email addresses of their clients and the system would go to work for them. It would automatically email a beautiful newsletter with the agent's picture and contact information every two weeks. So I arrived back at the office for a follow-up a year later, and more than 85% of the agents did not add a single client, a single friend, a single relative into their CRM, their contact management database. Why? Well, Lauren, I just didn't have enough time. There's just so much to do in this business. Your single most important purpose is to build that list of people who know, like, and trust you and remind them that you need their help. Everybody's heard of a CRM, a Contact Relationship Management Software Program. You might use Top Producer or Apto or ActCRE or Realnex CRM, but you have to have contacts in order to manage the relationship with them. So an agent raises their hand and says, Lauren, I thought the most important thing was really delivering great service. You talk about the service thing and just sending out a bunch of emails and newsletters, well that isn't delivering great service. Yes, absolutely, customer service is our number one goal. But here's a secret, listen closely. You have to have a customer in order to deliver great service. You have to find someone first before you can service them, and then you have to stay in touch with them so they refer you more clients. So I get back to the office after lunch and people are high-fiving and they're cheering and I'm thinking they finally did what they were supposed to do. No, no, Alan just hit high score on Angry Birds. So I introduced them to a new game that I call Angry Real Estate Broker. Some days it's like the wheel is spinning but the hamster is dead. And we've got to laugh at this stuff, folks. Remember, if you can't laugh at yourself, look to the person next to you and laugh at them. I mean, look at them. So again, why are past clients so critical to your business? 64% of our business comes from people who like and trust us, our repeat customers, our social network, our sphere of influence, and referrals from those groups. There are a few keys to reconnecting properly. 
and I'm going to go through them with you. Step one is to create a list of past clients. I know this part is rocket science. Step two is to rank the past clients. Step three is to mail them an apology letter. Step four is to call or go visit them. Step five is to mail them a handwritten follow-up note. Step six is to begin an automatic communication system with your CRM. And step seven is to begin your event marketing program and value-added follow-up program. So doing a quick run-through, obviously you need to create a list. Hopefully you already have a CRM, but if not, hopefully you have all of your past clients and your sphere of influence in your email or files so you can create a contact database. Then you have to separate that list into groups because you're going to be slowly adding them into your system so that you do it correctly. Separate those who are your best advocates, perhaps ones that have already referred you business or are repeat customers, and pull out those people you never ever want to see again. We've all had those clients from hell. The ones you want to maintain relationship with, rank them in groups, one through three or ABC or whatever. Best clients, decent clients, good prospects, and so on until you get to those that you don't like and they don't like you. Then craft an apology letter and start sending out five a day. And yes, I really do mean only five a day because you're going to follow up in a week. See, here's the thing. You've abandoned this person for six months, a year, three years, a decade, whatever. And then out of the blue, you send them a newsletter. Do you think they realize they're just being targeted with a generic mailing piece? When you send them a heartfelt apology letter rather than a newsletter, and then immediately follow up with a personal contact, they realize that you mean what you say, and that is what you need to do in order to re-energize your relationship and work toward a true referral business. It's three parts. Send the apology letter and then call them within a week. Uber trainer Brian Buffini would tell you to drop by instead. He calls it a pop by. But most of you will never do that. So you need to at least pick up the phone and call them. And then finish with a handwritten note. And by the way, this whole process won't take more than an hour a day. And it will be the best thing you've ever done. I know, I know. You don't have the time to do it. For a month or so, this may cut into your time to play Angry Birds or Bejeweled Blitz or Candy Crush. So start with a letter apologizing for not getting in contact sooner. There are a few components to doing this letter correctly, by the way. First, since you're only sending out five a day, handwrite their name and address on the front of the envelope. Don't pre-print a label because you want them to open it and you want them to know it's really something that you sent. If you don't have time to handwrite the addresses, then have an assistant or a family member do it. When they open the letter, there should be a headline, because the headline is what entices the person receiving the letter to actually take the time and read that letter. Now, I've had a lot of fun with headlines, by the way. When we're sending letters to commercial for sale by owners, we often print a huge headline across the top third of the letter that says this letter has been pre-crumpled for your convenience. The rest of the letter explains that selling a commercial property requires making that property stand out from the competition. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, we're the best at getting our messages read, and we're the best at making your property stand out. Then we crumple up the letter, we flatten it back out, and we stick it in an envelope and send it to the for sale by owner, hand addressed, and it feels different because it crinkles. So that client opens it, gets a chuckle, and we've gotten our message read. For example, most realtors put just listed or just sold or just leased on postcards. Not only are those dull and uninteresting headlines, but they're also done in realtor lingo instead of plain English. So try having a little fun with your postcards. Did you hear what happened to the landlord on 15th Street last night? It could happen to you next. The reverse side of the postcard explains that the neighboring landlord sold his investment property for a great price in a reasonable period of time because they hired you as their experienced real estate professional. And you can do the same for every other landlord in the area. You might want to have a postcard like the owner of the shopping center at 5th and Tillman got exactly what he deserved last night, and you can be next. And again, on the back, you can write that he was able to lease his retail space because you did the marketing. Anyway, for an apology letter, we need to use the same logic to get it read. Here are some headlines that I wouldn't use. I would have contacted you, but I was kidnapped by aliens. It will get attention, and it will get your message read, but they're going to think you're goofy. I would have maintained contact, but I was trapped with the ghost of a Victoria's Secret model on a desert island. By the way, this is a headline an agent in our mentoring program used. I do not recommend it. Here are some of the headlines of some apology letters that I've seen in the past that I really liked. And you thought you'd never hear from me again. 
I am so sorry, let me explain. And a great headline I learned 20 years ago from the great real estate trainer Joe Stumpf was, I need to get this off my chest before I explode. The letter itself can be relatively simple. It might say, John and Helen, you might be wondering why you haven't heard from me lately. I'm embarrassed and I'm writing today to apologize because I've been a bit inconsistent in my follow-up. I do think about you, but I've been so focused on the clients I'm working with currently to buy, sell, or lease that I haven't gotten back to staying in touch with you, and that's just not right. It makes me feel guilty for not maintaining the relationship, which makes it harder for me to reach out and reconnect. Over the past few weeks, I've been rethinking my focus and reviewing my business, and I've come to realize that I need to concentrate on the relationships I've already built, because I really do value those relationships. I don't consider you just a customer. I really consider you a friend, and I want to rekindle that friendship. So I hope you accept my apology, and I intend to stay in touch with you regularly. If there is ever anything I can do to assist you, please don't hesitate to call, and if not, I'll be calling you. Thanks. Next, make a phone call to them, but not to ask them for business, not now. You want to reconnect with them. Ask them about four things, their family, their occupation, their activities, and their goals. Have you read the book Swim with the Sharks by Harvey McKay? He talks about how he built his envelope empire by understanding everything about his clients. He wanted to know them personally, their hopes, their dreams, what they enjoyed about their family activities. Why? Because it gives you the opportunity to connect with them on a different level than just business. And also, if you only talk to them about business, that's how they view you. You want to show them that you care about them, not just that they can give you something. And anything you learn about them, put into your database so that when you do call them again, you can ask about their daughter Sarah and her dance recital, or about his golf game, or whether or not he got out on that deep sea fishing trip he wanted so badly, or whether his brother-in-law has gotten out of prison yet. Right after you talk to them, spend three minutes and write a four or five line handwritten note. Thanks so much for speaking with me on the phone today. It was great reconnecting, and I'm so happy you're enjoying your new space at wherever. I'm telling you that these few steps will more than double the number of referrals you're getting from past clients right now. And if you contact only five clients a day, that's five letters, five handwritten notes, and five phone calls, in 20 work days, you'll contact 100 of your past clients. And again, I don't like that term, but we're using it here. And then don't abandon them again. Go into your CRM, add the contact's name and the email address, and put them on an action plan. Create an action plan to, at the very least, send them a holiday email every month. Add them to a newsletter if you can. And once you've done the basics, the next steps are to start adding something to your communications that provide value to your customers. And then you're going to start holding client events. And we'll come back to that at the end of today's program and give you some interesting and fun ideas for that. Now, let's shift back to current customers because remember, these are the people who are most likely to be able to identify and hopefully influence customers who are in the market today ready to buy, sell, invest, or lease in property. So we want to initiate the relationship, making presentations that shift customers' expectations. See, in order to convince your current clients that you need their help in your business, you need to accomplish two tasks. First, you have to be worthy of the referrals. So you have to deliver that exceptional service that we keep talking about, that exceptional service that you're promising them. And second, you have to program them from the very first meeting that you need their help and remind them throughout the process. Maybe programming is too strong a word because what we're really doing is systematically asking for their assistance with our business. They need to understand first that our business truly is based on the referrals we receive and we really need their help. And second, that we can spend more time focused on them and on their needs if we don't have to spend 30 or 40 percent of our time prospecting for new business from people who don't already know us, like us, or trust us. And again, everything is a process and it starts with the first meeting. So before you ever leave for the listing appointment or the first tenant rep meeting, send out a resume package ahead of your appointment. And by the way, sending out a resume package ahead of an appointment is just smart business. You are applying for the job of representing this client, and when you apply for a job, you send something ahead of yourself. And that one step will dramatically increase your closing ratio. So here's the sad and scary truth. Property owners will make a snap decision about you when they first meet you. 
for whatever reason, they may form a poor first impression of you, and it's tough to recover from that. They might not like the way you dress. They might not like the way your hair's done. You might remind them of their Uncle Mike who mooches off them and lives on the sofa. Or their snotty cousin who knows absolutely everything. Whatever the case is, if you're one of three or four agents interviewing for the position of marketing their $5 million high-tech facility, the owners are probably going to have an affinity for one of the agents that they meet. There are some techniques that can help you to overcome this. Mirroring, personality complementation, and other techniques that may or may not be something you've heard of. But we don't have two weeks here today, and it takes months of practice to develop strong skills like these. You need to improve your odds and change the business owner or property owner's attitude toward you before you ever meet. One way of accomplishing that task is to find common ground with the sellers and pre-sell the owner with a resume book. A resume book or a resume binder or a pre-listing package can set you apart from the competition, particularly if it includes some personal information and experience outside real estate. Let me give you a few minor things that you should put in a resume package. Put in a reference list of similar clients, if you have them. Or put in a flyer on similar properties in the area that you've sold or leased or managed. And if you don't have any, that's okay. Create a list of those that have been leased or sold by your firm. Include your personal mission statement that you want to be the client's real estate advisor. And we all know that the client will be interviewing three or four other brokers, right? And the client should really interview all of them on equal footing, right? So I include a suggested list of interview questions that are slanted towards me. What? Is that not okay in your area? I even laminate it so it stands out. Some of the questions I'd include, do you have an assistant? Do you have a team that assists you with marketing and the sale of the property? Do you have a transaction coordinator? Do you have a clearly written, defined marketing program for my property? You can put in an outline of your real estate team and their job functions. And by the way, if you don't have a team, that's okay. Does your firm have a receptionist? Okay, that's your client coordinator for your team. Do you have a title agent you work with regularly? That's your conveyancing manager. And most important in the package is to include information about the fact that you work primarily by referral. When you get to the appointment, paste a smile on your face before you enter the lobby or ring the doorbell or get out of your car. Why? Because too many commercial brokers attempt to create a business-like look for themselves, feeling that uh, they appear professional, but instead they look like they're frowning. How many of you have lost a listing to someone that was nowhere near your equal, but was bubbly, bouncy, and enthusiastic during the presentation? I have. It's because you don't look professional when you don't smile. You look constipated instead. So put on a big smile and be certain to make positive eye contact and pay a sincere compliment if you can. Now, this is a beautiful lobby. Did you design it yourself? Follow the property owner to their office, conference room, or any place where you can sit down. I always attempt to sit down with a client first prior to viewing the property. This is important for two reasons. You want to break the ice with the client if possible. And some methods of breaking the ice include asking something about the client personally, or making a joke, or commenting on something non-offensive such as the weather. You've got to avoid subjects like politics or religion, of course, unless you find that your political views are absolutely in line with the client, but I would not suggest it. Next, you've got to build a bridge between you and the client. In order for the client to believe that you want to do what's in their best interest rather than just get the listing, you have to show them that you care. Once we break the ice and get down to business, my initial speech works something like this. Dear Mr. Big Company President, first I want to thank you so much for meeting with me and my team. I just want to start by explaining that I understand you have a number of options open to you in selling this building or leasing this space. You can choose a variety of great real estate professionals to help you achieve your goals. Hopefully you'll find that I'm a bit different than the traditional commercial realtor. I'm not here to try and sell you on my company or get the listing but rather to see if and how I can help you. See, I approach real estate from the consultative side. Most of my business comes from referrals from my clients. If you and I decide to work together, I want you to select me and my team, not because I tell you some price you want to hear, but because my marketing and service plan are superior to anyone in the region. I'm hoping that you'll select me to be your partner in getting this property sold or leased, and that you'll be so pleased with the service that my team and I deliver that you'll tell your friends and everyone you know that they shouldn't call some other company. They need to call Lauren Kime. That allows me to focus my time on really taking care of my clients rather than spending 40 or 50 percent of my time out hunting down the next deal like so much of my competition. I am not here for the one transaction. I'm here to show you how I can assist you and to assist everyone you know. I hope that makes sense. 
Now I'd like to ask you a few questions so I can better understand your situation and your goals so I can better determine if and how I can help you. Now you can use similar verbiage if you're meeting a tenant to represent instead of a listing. The initial words you say show the client that you're different than other agents, that you're not there for one deal and that you need their help. Everything you do after that introduction builds on those initial keys. So why do we ask questions before proceeding? You can qualify the client and simultaneously show them that you care about their wants and needs by asking them questions about their situation. Don't try to sell them on your marketing or your experience or your techniques at this point. Just ask questions and listen. It's also very important to take notes and actually write down what the owner tells you. This is important so you can remember everything later, but it's also important to show the client that you care enough to take notes about their situation. So you might ask, what is your motivation in selling or leasing this space? Is there anything that might prevent you from going forward with your plans? How much are you considering asking for this property or for this space? Who will be involved in the decision for pricing the space and hiring a firm? Have you had any previous experience with an agent that was negative? Is there something specific you expect from an agent representing you? And what would it do to your plans if you were unable to secure a tenant in your time frame? Understanding the property owner's needs and objectives allows you to create a solution for those needs and a plan to accomplish the objectives. You can tailor your marketing and servicing presentation to their situation and their goals. Once you have a clear understanding of the client's situation, ask if you can view the entire property and come back to the conference room and lay out a solution to their problem with your marketing and servicing plan. And if you want to see our full listing presentation, we do have a DVD on presentation techniques available. But suffice it to say that we need to build on our initial comments throughout the listing process. When you sign the listing or the lease or the tenant rep agreement, Explain to your client that they may encounter others that need help, and referring people to us frees up time from prospecting so we can concentrate on helping them. After securing the listing, we put into place what we call our current customer processes. Everything you do after securing that listing or tenant rep contract and every communication you have should be focused on two ideas. First is making the invisible visible. And second is getting the client to say wow six times or more during the process. When I say making the invisible visible, what I mean is that I want you to show them what you're doing to serve them. What do clients think you do after you take a listing? That's right, they think we fly to Las Vegas and drink and gamble, or perhaps we lay on the beach in Maui waiting for their space to get leased or sold by somebody else. That's what they think. We have to not only communicate with them, but show them what is really happening behind the scenes and remind them every step of the way that we need their help. So we use something called the email update campaign. One of the many things we do is to immediately put all of our clients onto an email campaign that sends out specific emails for the first 120 days of a listing. These emails partly depend on the type of property, whether it's a lease or a sale, a parcel of land or an office building or a retail space and so on. The email both updates the clients and asks for their help. During the first 120 days, they receive a series of 17 emails from us just from our letters program. There are other things we send them as well. For example, on day one, they get an email thanking them for listing. That's a no-brainer. But everything we send them includes some information asking for their help. Thank you for listing email. And it reads, thanks so much for entrusting the sale of your property to our team, the Kime Group. We'll work hard to get your property sold as quickly as possible. We'll do our best to provide service that's exceptional in every way possible. Please let us know if at any time you feel that we're not living up to our end of the bargain or doing less than we should. And always keep in mind that most of our business is referred to us by happy customers. Our first goal is to help you get your property leased or sold. But ultimately, our mission is to do more than just sell one property. We're hoping to provide such a great experience while selling your property that you enthusiastically refer us to everyone you know. So if you are happy with our services and come across other people who are looking to buy, sell, or invest in commercial real estate, please refer them to us. And again, thank you so much for choosing our team to market your property. Now about three days later, they get an email from our assistant. And the headline is, I'm here to help. The email reads, hi, my name is Kerry, and I'm writing you a letter to introduce myself and explain what my responsibilities are in helping Lauren Kime to sell your property. My official title is Client Services Coordinator. 
and I am the person who makes sure you're satisfied in every part of your real estate experience. As I'm sure Lauren already explained, our goal is to become your real estate team for life. We want you to be able to tell every friend, every relative, every coworker, every business associate that we really are different. And if they want the best experience possible in buying, selling, or investing in commercial real estate, they should call Lauren or me. The next section simply outlines the responsibilities for feedback and marketing. But the email finishes with, and I keep in touch with you just like Lauren does, to let you know what's happening with the sale each and every step of the way. Remember, if there is ever anything I can do to make your move easier, please don't hesitate to call me. Lauren wants each of our clients to receive special treatment, and that's what we intend to give you. Just tell me what you want, and it's as good as done. Under the signature line, we add a postscript that reads, P.S., we invest most of our time delivering first-class service to our clients, and we spend very little time chasing new business. We build strong, lasting, lifetime relationships, one person and one business at a time. And because we do, most of our new clients come to us on the advice of people who have learned to trust and respect us. And by the way, if you don't have an assistant, does that mean you can't send them this email? Or does it just mean that you have to restructure the email to come from your office secretary instead? Or the broker of your company instead? You can have an email sent from a commercial or investment mortgage lender, somebody that you work with, or a 504 lender just stating that they're sending an email on behalf of you. That even if the client doesn't want to purchase another property, as part of your relationship with that lender, the lender is making themselves available to your clients to give financial advice. And by the way, the client is lucky to have you as their agent because you are one of the best in the industry. If they have any other friends who need help, they should refer them to you because you're just so totally awesome. And by the way, will a lender create an email and email that to your clients if you ask them to? Of course they will. And that creates a third-party endorsement of your service, doesn't it? We do a marketing email after the first week explaining what we've done so far because honestly, we do the same thing every time. Dear John, we've now submitted your listing to over 1,200 websites. We've published a virtual tour. We've set up a, a unique property website. We've sent an email to over 3,000 realtors in the region, and we sent an email to 1,257 investors in our database. This email keeps them informed and makes the invisible, the behind-the-scenes things that we do, visible to that client. And we do a follow-up marketing email about a month into the listing saying where we are with marketing and how, as hard as we try, the word never gets out as quickly as any of us would like. And if there are any showings generated, they may not always be us showing the property, but the clients will come because of our marketing. Because buyers and investors see our marketing and they call the agent that they're comfortable working with or that they've worked with in the past. Now this whole series of letters is written in advance. So my assistant adds a new client and plugs them into one of our email programs and just clicks go. It takes minutes once the systems are in place. And again, we send 17 of these emails out in the first 120 days based on the property type. Is that more than some of our competition is doing right now? And when we put a property under agreement or an escrow, we start a new wave of emails that explains the process and again reminds them that we need their help with referrals every step of the way. One of the more fun emails is a list of the 39 things that can go wrong during a commercial transaction, from underappraising to finding biological material in the property during a phase two. It's basically an email with a whole lot of scary stuff in it. And at the end of the email, it says, well, now aren't you glad you hired my team to assist you through this? Again, everything you send out should include something at the bottom regarding referrals. I said earlier that we have to make the invisible visible, and that's part of what we do with the email program. But we also need to deliver a constant wow every step of the way. So we look for those moments during the marketing phase or the negotiation phase or even the settlement phase of the transaction where we can do something that stands out, like the Ritz-Carlton knowing our names when we walk up to the counter. We've actually identified more than 30 points in the transaction when we can do something outrageous, which we do as part of a full day workshop, where we outline a lot more strategies. But I'll give you a few ideas. If you're representing commercial tenants for office space or retail, do you have an architect meet with them during the process in order to facilitate the build out of the space? If not, you should. You should be the coordinator of everything so that you remain the focal point of that transaction. And by the way, one wow in the process is to go over the site location process on your first meeting and give the client a written outline which explains that you'll be finding the best properties, 
scheduling showings, writing a letter of intent, negotiating a formal lease, speaking with zoning about how the building is going to be used, and helping select building inspectors, architects, space planners, and so on. Anyway, have the architect or space planner meet the client at your office if possible. You can introduce them, sit down for a minute, and then go get up and get a cup of coffee for them, or make copies, or do something else. When you leave the room, the architect or space planner should give you a third party reference. After all, you're bringing them into the transaction. It's the least they can do. The space planner can say, by the way, you are so lucky to be working with Lauren Keim. He is the best in the area, and I've worked with everybody. If you know anyone else, make sure they refer them to Lauren so they don't get stuck with some other agent like Bruce Wayne over at Sign of the Bat Realty. That's a third party professional endorsement. You can do it with a commercial lender, you can do it with an attorney who drafts the contract or the lease, and almost anyone that you refer to the client, can't you? Another idea is moving boxes, and we've stolen this from the residential side of the business. If you're working with small or moderate sized retail or office tenants, what can you do that doesn't necessarily take a lot of effort, but positively surprises the client? We've contacted a few grocery stores around our offices and found some would allow us to pick up those empty egg boxes that they throw away after eggs are delivered. Egg boxes are great because they are solid and they've got handles, but they still fold up. So we pick up a bunch of them and we keep them on hand. And when we have a client that's retail or office relocating to a new site that we found them, we stop by with boxes. I thought you might be able to use a couple of additional boxes for packing and moving your files. Do they appreciate that? Absolutely. They are thrilled that we are that concerned about them. Again, look for positive ways to surprise your clients. Let me give you a good example from the residential side of the business. When a buyer is approved for their mortgage, we don't let the lender call the buyer to let them know they're approved. Instead, the buyer's agent goes to the buyer's workplace with three or four balloons, a coffee mug with our name on it, and some candy kisses. Why? Because even if the buyer believes they're going to be approved for their mortgage, they still have some anxiety. They're still nervous about it and anxious. That's some concern. What if it doesn't go through? And you're not only relieving that anxiety, but you're doing it in a dramatic way. The client is thrilled, and they will walk you around their office introducing you to everybody in their company. Remember that if you do this on the commercial side, that business owner buying a new property has friends at the Chamber of Commerce that have their properties on the market with Bad Breath Realty down the street. And they haven't been able to get their agent on the phone for the last three weeks. And here you are stopping by to visit yours, with gifts no less. This creates a word of mouth campaign. Can you create similar wows for your commercial clients? Of course you can. Look what fits into your product type, retail, office, land development, hotels, and figure out where you can create those wow moments. You can also provide a wow and leverage your client's networks at the same time. Property owners really want to get their property sold or leased, don't they? You can create a short video about the property literally in minutes. First, film a generic short clip with any HD video camera. You can even do it with your iPhone. This clip might say something like, Hi, I'm Peter Parker with Web Swinger Commercial Real Estate. Please contact me if you'd like a personal appointment to see this great property. And if you need any assistance buying, selling, leasing, or investing in real estate, please remember me, I'm Peter Parker. It really doesn't matter what you say. Next, go out and take a few still photos of the property you're marketing, or a few short video clips. Now go to Movie Maker on your PC or iMovie on your Mac, just free software, import the clip, then import the still photos or the short clips you've made of the property that you're selling. And by the way, you can pan still photos as if they're video, string them together in a few minutes, just line them up and string them together. Now click on that little share button in the upper right hand corner that's featured on most software and select YouTube and upload it to YouTube. Again, this takes minutes. Now here's the important part. Send an email with a link in it to your property owner. Hi Dick, it's Lauren. I just built a short video on your property. You can find it at the link below. Can you do me a favor? We never know where buyers or tenants might come from. So if you have a Facebook page, can you click on the little F next to the video on YouTube and post it to your Facebook page and ask your friends to share it and spread the message? If you use Twitter or Pinterest or some other social media, you can share it there as well. Again, we never know where a buyer might come from, and hopefully we can enlist the help of those people that are in your circle of contacts, your circle of influence. By the way, will the vast majority of commercial property owners post this on their Facebook page? 
Absolutely. And will their friends actually play the video? Yes, many of them will because they're curious. And whose advertisement will they be watching? That's you. And by the way, at the same time, you're showing your client that you go above and beyond what other agents are doing to get a property sold or leased. Now let's be frank. If I have an agent that's part of my team or that I'm mentoring that is listing a multi-million dollar office building, well, we have somebody go out professionally and videotape that building. And by the way, those sellers will still put it on their Facebook page or put it on LinkedIn and tweet it. And who is connected to industry leaders in your area? Think about it. And by the way, if you're working as a tenant rep, you can still build a video. You can put a quick video together for the space that they're leasing and send it to them because they might want to share it on their Facebook page for their employees and their customers. And they do. You simply have to change the intro clip. Welcome to your new space. I'm your personal commercial realtor, Lauren Keim, and I thought you'd like a quick video tour of your new location. Can't wait for you to move in. Again, part of what we're looking to do is create a word of mouth campaign about our service. But we also want to be able to ask for referrals. Everybody's heard of Jack Canfield. He's the author of the wildly successful series, Chicken Soup for the Soul. Here's a photo of Jack with me at an event in Anaheim. I wrote Life Lessons. Jack, of course, sold about 110 million copies of Chicken Soup for the Soul. I think at last count I sold something like eight of Life Lessons. But Jack is a great guy. Anyway, Jack wrote a great book called The Success Principles, where he outlines that you have to first earn the right to ask for a referral before you ask for them. When someone says, wow, thank you, you can then respond with, no, thank you. And if you run across anybody else who could use my services, I'll be happy to do the same for them. I'm also going to tell you something we call the last seven day strategy. To contact the client every day for the last seven days before settlement or before the move-in date of the lease. There's always something you can talk about, but the idea is to be there for them and to look for problems to solve. Any problem you're able to solve will create advocates of your business. After the sale, when the sale closes or the tenant moves into their new space, you have to continue that relationship. Call right after they move in their space, just like the Ritz-Carlton does when somebody gets into a room. And honestly, how hard is it to call a client after settlement or after a move-in date and find out how that move went? Did everything go as planned? I just want to thank you again for using our team to find space for your business. I know you're in the process of moving into the space and I just want to make sure everything's going well. No hidden surprises, right? Some agents actually stop by the, the move-in date and bring a few pizzas along. That's an additional wow to your service. Call again a month after the transaction closes and ask how they're doing. Ask about their family or what they enjoy. And then start your after-sales service program. Create a new series of uh, update emails that will go out over the next two years. An immediate note or card thanking them for working with you. A second one a week later giving them a few reminders. Then you have a six-month anniversary, a one, two, and three-year anniversary email. And you're going to put them into your ongoing CRM program. You should be maintaining regular contact. But let me give you a few thoughts on the automated follow-up. What should you send? Newsletters, recipe cards. There are two items that garner the best response from customers. The first is evidence of your production, and the second is providing something of value. Evidence of production might be statistics in the market. It might be showing them specific sales you've done recently, or it might include stories about recent successful sales or leases that were very difficult. And by the way, if you send a note with a story about how you were able to help a chef to purchase his first restaurant by partnering with an investor, or how you successfully found financing for a laundromat, or how you completed the sale of a medical office building or an assisted living facility that had trouble being financed, it gives the reader a picture of something else you do that they may not have even considered. Have you ever run into an old friend or relative or past client who talked about a transaction like leasing a commercial space or selling an investment property or an assisted living facility and asked them why they didn't call you and had them say to you, I didn't know that you did that. I thought you needed a specialist in medical office space or a specialist in assisted living facilities in order to sell. When you tell stories, again with a headline that gets the story read, you are showing your clients visually what you do. Also. The more confidence a client has in you and your abilities, the more likely they are to refer you business. A second item that works is providing something of value. Big commercial real estate firms often send out information that includes market information. 
Such is a report that shows what buyers and investors are paying in cap rates for commercial property in a certain region. Or perhaps what the typical office rental rate is in an area. Or the typical retail rate in high-end shopping centers. This type of material also interests the client because they want to know what their properties are worth or what they should be asking in rental rates. Good communications give good information, but lead the reader back also to your website for complete details. Remember that you want them coming back to you over and over and over again. A strong headline might read, Cap rates fall in downtown Phoenix, driving investment real estate prices up. The article you're sending your clients as an email or as a physical letter might refer to one aspect of the market, but promise full details if they check out your website. And by the way, just smart business, your website should include a plethora of articles on the local real estate market, and specifically on the product types you're marketing, medical office, retail, general office, hotel, gas stations, whatever. When you're emailing clients, you might also pull good articles from other sources on how to maximize investment value or how to increase returns. Make sure you're allowed to repost them. Put them in your blog on your website and in your monthly or bi-weekly communications with your recent sales. In fact, one of the most successful things I've personally done is to keep an eye open for articles I find interesting that might be good for one or more of my clients. I'll then email it to the client it pertains to along with a quick note. Hey John, I ran across this article and thought of you. Thought you might find it interesting. A second option is to provide something of value. Brian Buffini preaches setting up relationships with other businesses and having those other businesses provide discounts, free advice, or something else to your clients in return for being able to tap into your current relationships. That creates a win-win. For example, a good financial planner might be willing to pay for a mailing to your business clients in hopes of getting an endorsement from you. You might send a letter stating that you have negotiated a free hour of consultation for each of your clients through a great financial planner. This is providing something of value to your clients and also leveraging your other relationships. When you lease retail space to a client, you might want to send a, a coupon out or a discount out on their behalf to your current database. It builds a stronger tie with that retail tenant, gives your other clients something of value, and shows your clients some evidence of success in the form of a successful transaction. And a final point on after-sales service is to start a consistent program of event marketing. I've had the opportunity and the privilege to spend time with several dozen of the country's top real estate professionals. And there are a few characteristics that are common between most or all of them. For example, they all have systems in place. They all have a team to help them deliver that service. They are all committed to delivering the best service possible and they all take the time to reach out and communicate one-on-one -on -one with their best clients, whether that's a regular phone call or a note card. And one of the most common key elements I found is that they all have some sort of regular events that they invite clients to. And some of those events are business related and some are more personal in nature. But each of them tells me that they get more referrals after an event than at any other time. And events can be as simple as a wine and cheese party or as complex as a large event. If you get the opportunity to attend a Rick DeLuca event, take the time. He's great to listen to. He owned a real estate firm back in Reno, Nevada in the 80s and early 90s. And he talks about how Pavarotti came to Reno and Rick purchased 300 tickets for his best clients and set up a catered wine and cheese party at the event center an hour before the event. The problem was that thousands of other attendees followed his clients down the escalator to his party and Rick's bill ended up somewhere north of $35,000 for the night. However, he does point out that he made more than $100,000 in referrals that he received from that one night. Now, I'm not suggesting that most of you have a huge event like that, but I will tell you that events fall into two categories. The first is to have an informational event. For example, you can get an insurance expert to come do a workshop at a local hotel on the impact of Obamacare on small business. Have the insurance company underwrite the cost of the event or get sponsors so you're not digging into your own pocket. But invite everyone in your database. Introduce the speaker because it is providing something of value to your clients. Perhaps you want to do a seminar on what's happening in the marketplace to cap rates, occupancy rates, lease rates, and so on. You can invite a commercial lender to help sponsor the event and speak as well. The other type of event, of course, is something more personal. My team and I generally do a family fun day where we might use my house because I have a couple of acres, or we might rent a park and invite everyone in their families. 
People show up and the only thing many of them have in common is us. You can do a children's movie morning at a local theater. Many of them will give you a great deal on tickets if you buy 60 or more of them. And parents love the fact that you're taking an interest in their families. You could do the same thing with a magic show, a comedy show, or anything. Or you can step back to at least do the periodic cocktail party or wine and cheese party. And you can do it at your office or at your home. It does not have to be fancy. It does not have to cost a lot of money. The point is to invite your clients and socialize with them on a different level. Again, it's the best thing you can do. I want to give you one other thought on clients. When they do refer someone to you, you have to show them that you're worthy of that referral. If you can wow them when they refer you someone, you will automatically receive more referrals from them. When you refer to client, immediately follow up with a phone call to the person who referred them. Thank them, of course. You're all doing that, right? Then send them something small. Don't wait for the transaction to close. Get something out to them right away. We have on hand a few dozen coffee mugs with our name on it. We send the, or deliver a coffee mug to their office filled with candy, kisses, and a swizzle stick that says thank you on it. The coffee mugs cost about four bucks a piece. And by the way, the mug sits on their desk and reminds everyone around them about you. If they refer you multiple clients, you'll have to come up with other items to send. That's the first wow of the transaction because they don't expect you to send something right away. The second is when you send them a follow-up note that says you now have a double responsibility. If John refers you as friend Sally, because I have no imagination when it comes to names, you have to let John know that of course I want to do a great job for Sally because that's who I am, that's what I do. But I also want to do a great job because you, John, took the time to refer me to Sally and I want that to reflect on you as well. That's the second contact. From there forward, make sure you send an update to the referring party every single month. Put it in your calendar or put it in your CRM or somewhere and send them an update as to what's happening with the person or property they referred to you. Again, this will so impress them that they'll be more than confident to refer you more people in the future. And by the way, if you follow up with a coffee mug and then a double responsibility letter and then keep in touch with the referring party every month to let them know how it's going, would you be different than everyone else in your marketplace? People don't care what you know until they know that you care. So some of the keys I wanted to get across today. You need to learn to understand how others see you or how they see your company. You need to build your vision from the point where you want to be, not the point where you are today. You need to be visible at strategic moments. And you need to identify those moments of truth in your relationship with customers where something can go badly, something can go as expected, or where you might be able to positively impress those clients. You have to be consistent at all times. And you must encourage feedback from your customers so you can better understand them and so you can better provide value to those customers. And you must give yourself adequate time to create the systems you need to provide the service your customers expect. Anything you can build into your plan that delivers something beyond their expectations is critical to building that customer experience. Can you compete with the corporate owned giant companies? If you're working as part of a big national or international real estate firm, that's great. You have lots of tools and contacts built by your company. If you're a smaller boutique company or a regional company, that's also great because you have your pulse on what's happening in the local market and you can connect with those local players. Can small companies compete with large companies? The simple answer is that you can. But Lauren, the big firms have relationships built with corporations. Yes, they do. But here's a couple interesting facts. Nearly every large contract is started with a senior VP of a company having a personal friend or connection with a realtor. We start small and we build that relationship. Think about any industry and how it's evolved over the years. Let's look back at technology in the 1980s during the computer revolution. IBM was by far the leader. When was the last time you saw an IBM PC? In 1980, IBM was the eighth largest company in the country. The second largest computer company was Zenith Computers. Next was Compaq. Do any of them exist anymore? Google didn't exist back then. Yahoo didn't exist. Apple was barely surviving. Bethlehem Steel was the second largest steel maker in the country and the 38th largest company in the country. They are now bankrupt and gone. Kodak was the 30th largest company and what's happened to them today? Think about that. Companies change over time. That creates opportunity. 
Back then, Home Depot and Sam's Club didn't even exist. There was Builder Square, which closed, I think, in 1999. Uh, there were big chains like Blockbuster Video, Hollywood Video, Linens and Things, KB Toys, Border Books, Sam Goody, and Woolworth. So who were the top department stores in the 1980s, which was not that long ago? Walmart and Target were really just getting started in the Midwest. We didn't see them in the Northeast until 10 years later. There was Montgomery Ward all over the country. J.C. Penney wasn't in bankruptcy. Marshall Fields, Bambergers, and so many others that are now long gone. My point is that any of you have the same opportunity as any corporate-owned firms to build those relationships and utilize the resources of your network to build that business. This is your year. Who can you connect with now that can help you or that you can help? Think about it. And let me leave you with a story. Originally, I heard this story from a minister in Southern California, although I've seen variations of it over several venues, and I apologize to whoever originated it. But a minister said he was walking through San Francisco one cool fall morning and came upon a building site that was circled with those high privacy fences to keep people out, the ones that have posters on the outside. He said he climbed through a break in the privacy fence and noticed four masons or four bricklayers at different places, each of them building walls. So he looked around at the hole in the ground and the walls that were going up, and curious about the project, he went to the first one and asked, what are you doing? Well, the first mason looked up and said, what's it look like I'm doing? I'm laying bricks. This guy was obviously from Jersey. This is a guy who has a task. I'm doing floor time. I'm holding an open house. I got a task. This is the category that most real estate agents fall into, and one of the reasons that 19 out of 20 real estate agents last less than three years in the industry. So the minister approaches the second mason and says, what are you doing? And the second mason says, I'm building a wall here. This is someone who at least has a job. I'm selling commercial real estate. I'm working with an investor. I'm listing a property for sale. Finding the third mason, the minister asks the same question. What are you doing? And the third mason says, I'm building a church. This one at least has a career. I'm listing and selling commercial real estate. I'm trying to sell 25 properties this year. This is the spot where most of us plateau. We work and we work and we work in our business instead of on our business and we stagnate. So the minister goes to the final mason and he says, what are you doing? And the final mason says, can't you see it? We're building a great cathedral over there. People are going to be getting married and sharing their lives together. Over here, we're going to start a soup kitchen and feed the hungry and the homeless. And over on that side, we're going to be doing midnight basketball. We're going to create a program and get kids off the street. Now this is a person who understands the big picture. It's someone who clearly has a vision of how things will be. If you want to be wildly successful in your real estate practice, you need to see your business, your practice, from the point where you want to be, not the point where you are. You have to envision what you want it to ultimately look like and build toward that vision. Now I'm going to leave you with some quotes that I did in one of our earliest fundamental programs because I want you to think about them. Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. It doesn't matter who you are or who you're competing against. You have no competition. Get out, take a shot, and make appointments. Christopher Reeve was quoted as saying, either you decide to stay in the shallow end of the pool or you go out in the ocean. Stop waiting in the kiddie pool for something to happen and go out and start creating your own destiny. And finally, George Eliot said, it's never too late to be who you might have been. It's time to step up and be the person you've always wanted to be, because you can. Again, I am Lauren Kime with Real Estate's Next Level, and I want to thank you so much for watching.